The haunting legends of a mighty Bigfoot have made man's blood run cold for centuries, some terrific and some terrifying. The Southern Appalachian Mountains whisper the mysteries of this strange and powerful creature through its smoky hills and ominous embrace. This is Brandon Thomas with Expanding Reality, elated to announce our very first Expanding Reality Excursions Befriending Bigfoot event. It's going to take place on a beautiful 27-acre ranch in Blairsville, Georgia, May 15th through the 20th. This intimate conference is going to feature Bigfoot adventure hikes in three different states, river kayaking, nightly presentations from such incredible presenters as Alexander Petikoff, Chris Matthew, Dave Zed, Preston Dennett, and many more. Also, we're going to be doing some UFO watching, some jam sessions, all kinds of hangouts. Visit expandingrealitypodcast.com slash events for more information. That's expandingrealitypodcast.com slash events. We'll see you there. choice right now right now between fear and love it's just a run out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth expounding reality a population of citizens capable of critical thinking we don't see things as they are we see them as we are There's a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. All right, feeling good, feeling fresh? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Chris Matthew, welcome back, brother. It is always cool to see you. How you been, dude? Fred, and thank you so much for having me back. Loving it, loving it, man. Good times and good to be back. Let's get weird. Let's get fucking weird, dude. Talking about weird, yeah. your uh, movie out on Tubi. Congratulations, by the way, which oh, is going to be you. linked uh, down below. I re- linked it in our recent episode with Karen Holton as well because we mentioned it on there. But I'm going to go ahead and link it here as well. But, man, congratulations. It's blowing up. I'll put it on and just let it play and walk off so that you get the extra play. You know what I mean? Uh, so, oh, But thanks. love the film. The way that you have you didn't update on it since the first time I saw it when it was on Amazon. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. And then, of course, we have new and exciting exciting things to look forward to with you always. We're going to talk about that. And also you're presenting and going to be hanging out with us in Georgia in May for our Befriending Bigfoot event, which we're extremely elated to get to hang out with you, dude. Uh, so let's talk about all of it. Um, now, uh, reminding it. the audience as well, all the ways to find you, your amazing for Forbidden Knowledge News Network, as well as all the ways uh, that you can be contacted, including your Tubi documentary. The other two episodes that you have had on here with us, uh, episode 90 and 209, will be located down below as well. Brother, from there, where would you like to start, man? Oh, I think I should start with saying, once again, love you, man. Thank you for having me on. Always a wonderful discussion. Let's start with the event. I'm super excited about it. This is going to be my first time speaking in front of people about these highly strange topics. And on top of that, hanging out with some amazing people and uh, possibly befriending a Bigfoot. You could absolutely befriend Bigfoot for damn sure. Um, Like for damn sure. And in fact, while we're talking about that, we haven't really done this on something. So let's just take a couple minutes here. I'm going to screen share and show you guys our website, which again, shout out Cam Kari. This man came in, read it our website. It's got a blazing intro that will lead you in here and then That's comes down beautiful. to the three things. I know this dude's amazing. Comes down to the three things that we've got going on here, the podcast, the publishing and the event and our publishing. This hosts all of our uh, books that we have out right now and all of these things are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble as well. We don't really talk about ourselves on the show, so actually it's interesting that we're doing this. But anyway, there's all the books, guys. But what we're talking about here is the events. So if you'd like to just go directly to that, it will be linked below. But expandingrealitypodcast.com slash events is where this can be found. There you can find all the information. Uh, the place is incredible, which we will talk about in a minute. But, dude, this is our planned itinerary. This is, you know, sort of what we're looking at. We've got Trey Hudson. We've got Scott and Sheila Granger. We've got Owen Hunt doing comedy. Uh, we've got Dave oh, Baker. Awesome who's fascinating. This Dave Baker was on um, Encounters. It's actually on Tubi right now as well. It was on Amazon also. 
but uh, he is uh, the last two episodes of the first season. And then you have the next night, we've got uh, Before Chris we go Matthew, on, I have to point out that at, from one to five on Thursday, you get Booger Alley Exploration. And <laughs> I'm just intrigued by the name, Booger Dude, Alley. This is with a couple of our, and, and look how it's laid out. I love this. And thank you for pointing it out. So the first night, everybody gets in, right? Trey Hudson is going to come out. And if you're familiar with him, he has the Meadow Project. We just had him on recently. Uh, his book is back I there just, somewhere. I just interviewed Trey for the next film. Dude, did you really? Yes, oh, did. my God. Okay, it, fuck. It was, I love how the epic. worlds collide like great. this. Okay, <laughs> yeah. awesome. And he was the last. Uh, he's doing this last minute because he's actually going to Egypt. So he's just going to pop in, do his stuff, hang out with us that night and bounce. But he is going to be bringing out his night vision and thermal imaging military grade equipment and shit so we're gonna go hike around the chat uh chattahoochee national forest which is right next to our spot and do all that now the booger alley of which you speak is other good friends of all of ours trey hudson's as well scott and sheila granger now they're local bigfoot experts that we got connected with um very serendipitously of course and they run squatch fishing is the name of their brand out there and they have the only um permit i think they're the only ones on record with a permit to do what they do on government lands in a, in a sense and they do it all over the place but one of their hiking spots and this is why we have them presenting with trey the night before because they've got some crazy fucking stories dude and some of the stories they're going to be telling us of are of a place called booger alley in georgia so our next day after we get the shit scared out of us or we get these amazing conversations um and this presentation the night before we're going to go hiking at that same exact area all day and go explore that place where they just talked about and all that kind of stuff so yeah booger alley man that's what they call it and boogers of course in the south they don't mean the things that come out of your nose tell tell me what boogers are chris you said well i've heard different definitions uh -huh. of boogers but for us boogers are like the little critters the little boogers that run around that's right that's right yeah. little critters that's right them little boogers so that's what this <laughs> is is booger alley and scott and sheila are amazing as well you're gonna absolutely love them so, yeah. Um, yeah, we're hiking in three different states, actually, because of the location of the event. Uh, we're really close to all these things. It's no more than an hour drive to, I think our furthest one's like an hour. Uh, and that's to go kayaking in Tennessee, which is going to be on our uh, third day there. And then we're also going to go hike in this upper Olympic uh, in the OC River right there or whatever. So that's in Tennessee. And then the next day, we're going to head up the North Carolina Trail after we hear Chris and Alexander Petikoff speak the night before. Very excited about this. And each night we'll be going outside to, you know, check out UFOs. We've got Les Durant, you know, coming out to bring his stuff to film UFOs and things. And he's also um, our presenter with Preston Dennett the next night. Um, and this guy is also on Encounters, I think, episode three of the first season. So super cool dude. All these guys are awesome. He's a local radio DJ as well. And then, of course, Preston Dennett, I mean, author of like 80,000 books and counting and just amazing guy. Going to tie some really cool freaky woo-woo Bigfoot stuff in. And then we got Dave Zed coming out uh him and i are just going to kind of break things down and then you guys get to share your experience on the last night we're just going to have a call out to whoever wants it but amazing things we've got the bigfoot museum in there as well and uh just a banger conference honestly and this the one thing about this too that i really want to kind of remind people of and why this is so damn cool is um like you get to hang out with us this isn't sort of a you go to a conference where there's booths and you got to buy the guy's book to stand in a line and then you get to sign the book and all those are cool and have their place. This is not that. This is where me, Chris, Alexander, Trey, Scott, Sheila, Dave, Zed, all of us, we're just going to be hanging out around a campfire, you know, just talking, right? And you get to hang out with us and ask us like real questions. It's not a real quick laminate badge and oh no, you didn't pay for the VIP. So you only get to hear my speech and leave. The presentations in the evening are very minimal. And that's a small part of this. Uh, really, it's the interaction. It's the getting amongst them, man. And that's where I feel the real connections are are going to be made here, and that's you know exemplary of this of this event here. So I'm really pumped about it. I am super pumped, and I have also decided what I will be giving my presentation about. It's going to relate to the current film that I'm producing, the next film, the forbidden documentary Doorways of Perception. If you'd like, I could give you a little little. He's a peeker sneaker into some of the topics that, that, that that'll be about there. Yes, please. Yeah. So I, everything that I've done since I've started forbidden knowledge news has been a culmination of this film and 
where my consciousness is headed, where all my theories are going. And it's just going to lead to more questions and theories. I don't think I'll ever have the answers to any of these things. Honestly, I don't think we're supposed to know the real answers to it, but we can know more based on our relative knowledge of everything we have and build on it. And I think there's always more layers to uncover, even though we have might master a certain layer, the next one has more information for us. And I've had so many amazing guests on since 2017 when I've started this. And it's like having mystery school esoteric teachers spending an hour to two hours with you a day, every day of your life, and just learning from some of the most incredible people on the planet. And I've learned that all of the topics I cover from paranormal, ufology, occult mysteries hidden history magic it's all connected in very 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 profound ways the film is going to focus on aspects of reality as it relates to life after death near-death experiences altered states shamanic journeys dream states synchronicities contact experiences, extraterrestrial and or spiritual, and how all these things come together in this nice paranormal soup and have incredible connections to what we are as humans and the human experience. So that is going to be what the next film is. And we're going to also weave a little bit of Bigfoot into that because he's part of that party. He's definitely Absolutely. part of that party. So yeah. yeah, that's what we got going. Dude, that's incredible. It sounds fucking amazing. I can't wait. I, how fantastic. What, yeah, man, how, I'm, I'm super excited. Where are you on shooting right now? I mean, what have you gotten? Where are you at? We are curious. about, ooh, we're almost halfway there. We've got about, I'd say, halfway there as far as uh, the shooting and pre-production and stuff like that. We've got about maybe four more interviews to do. We've got a few more on-site footage uh shot uh, shoots to do and uh we're gonna do a couple of those interviews at your event there and um yeah so we're hoping to do a couple of months of editing after that and a film release of october around somewhere around october just like the the previous film so roughly six months of production and we'll have it we have it popped out there. Wow. It's so fast, dude, to think what you do to, to, to do all of it. I know what video editing is, man, and you're just amazing at it. And then just to watch your films, like I said, we do put it on. Uh, Murray and I watched uh, the update on it, and then I've seen it since then as well. And then I went back Thank and you, looked at a few things so we could talk about them for this. But, man, every time I'm noticing something different, I'm, I'm appreciating just the the way you're going about it, man. You're just really crushing it with the editing. And again, the storytelling, everything's real seamless and flows together really well. Your voiceovers over imagery, like all of those things that you're doing is not going unnoticed. So well done, man. Thank you, brother. And we're going to step it up for this one. We're, we're getting better equipment. We're learning from the last experience. It's, you know, me and my fiance, Jen, are the primary producers of the film here. And uh, she's done some great camera work for the last one. She's getting even better. This is going to be, this, we're just, you know, up in, up in the, our game for this one even more. So we're excited. We're excited. That's adorable. And just behind the curtain here, y'all have been to the house, you and your beautiful fiance, or beautiful, beautiful Jennifer there. And yes. you two are incredible. And she is a delight for everybody. Them as a couple, absolutely beautiful. And she's just like this mystic, beautiful, warm powerful presence you know what i mean she's got this calm chill but like this joyous warmth to her to where you just want to talk to her and she'll talk to you about anything all day long but super sweet but you can tell there's so much wisdom in her eyes as well man just amazing couple you two are so just for behind the scenes peek here you're a beautiful couple and you have an amazing life and your, i'm your so excited because she's actually gonna get back into her healing modalities again that Very she's cool. really not visited for a while but she's gotten some inspiration and she thinks she you know it's time to get back in there and start helping people out so great things there 
It's so interesting because with my Dark Knight of the Whatever, Mary got really into astrology. And so now she's reading people's charts for him. She's gotten oh, deep sweet. dive. She's already on the second level of Ksenia's class. And so, yeah, it's like this interesting thing, man, where everybody's kind of getting into their powers and their vibe and going, how can I help? Yes. Fucking cool. All right. Well, I'm right super on. pumped about your next film, man. And I do want uh, some more teasers about it. But let's talk a little bit about Occult Louisiana and the things that you changed or added. Um, I just noticed a different film, man. It just looks... Uh, you know, and the first, there was nothing wrong with the first version. It just what you added to the second added so much more depth to the story. I could see why you did it, especially the John Lafitte stuff, um, the Lee Harvey Oswald stuff, the Carrie Thornley. Like this, it's um, the the pirates. I mean, all of it, dude, is so fascinating. So, talk to us a little bit about just I guess maybe some of the differences if you want to point them out because right now, I mean, you just have a full movie. You to to you, there's not a version one, version two. You just have the one that you have out. So you don't need right. to spend too much time on it because that'll kind of be too much for me. But really just talk about how many elements are in this thing because you're talking about Scott yeah. Pace's stuff, the voodoo, the ghosts, the, I mean, uh, the the stuff with Greg Little in the mounds. I mean, it's so much stuff, dude. It's amazing. Yes, it it was originally supposed to be, the way I originally envisioned it was a series that was going to be 30 to 40 minutes Per, per film, just short films, uh, short documentary series. But uh, as we went along, I had finished the first one and it was about 40 minutes long. And it was the original one that you were speaking about. And it had contained a few of the elements that you were speaking of. But once we had really gotten started looking into how the distribution works and the, some of the behind the scenes things, we realized it would just be a lot easier for us to just combine as much of this information as possible into a 90 minute film instead of three 30 minute episodes, three or four, you know, shorter episodes. So that's the way we decided to go. And, you know, it was originally supposed to be like that little docu mini docu series. And now it's going to be a documentary series of films. So we, you know, we start, we, release the 40 minute as a limited release and tested it out, saw how it did. And we were excited about that. And then I went back in and all the other concepts I put together into the film in, in the most cohesive way that I could put together and also entertaining and enjoyable way. And like you said, it starts out with just a little bit of the culture and some of my friends and colleagues views about growing up in Louisiana. Then you go to the history behind the JFK assassination, which much of the plot of the JFK assassination occurred in or around new Orleans. Most of the characters lived there. Clay Shaw, my producer and colleague, Corey Hughes, by the way, go get his book. A warning from history just came out. Um, he, was in the film. He's the one I interviewed for this this portion of it. He has uh, Rain Man level knowledge of Dude, the JFK assassination. I'm like, oh he my can just God. go on for he, you just let him go for hours. He will talk. He knows from the from like World War II to the end of the JFK assassination. Dude, insane he's, he's details got it all. too. He's like, and Very, those guys had yes. this color cuffling, so that's how you know. And I'm like, God damn, dude. And he just flows with it and it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 scary details, but he gives us those uh, amazing details about what's really behind the JFK assassination, mob relations in New Orleans, just integral little pieces and parts that not many people are familiar with. And then we dive into, we went and visited a couple of psychics in New Orleans and had some interesting conversations with them, got their insights into living there. Then the film goes to voodoo and the Jean Lafitte pirate history. Uh, the main interest of the voodoo was Marie Laveau. And if you've ever been to Louisiana or New Orleans, you immediately know who this woman is. She was a very famous character that brought voodoo to the mainstream, really. She commercialized voodoo in a way, uh, but it her, her techniques were ingenious and she was able to profit off of mysticism in some very interesting ways. And she even participated in a little blackmail and, uh, you know, um, some government nastiness where she had to embed herself and some of her 
the people that were servants at the time into these higher level organizations of politics and uh, leaders of the that period and find out secrets and sell secrets. So she was a little spy in some ways, which was very interesting. And a lot of people didn't realize that. And that to me was more interesting than a lot of the voodoo stuff, because a lot of that stuff was just put forward to make her more mystical and believable and put fear in the hearts of some people. So they would be more interested in dealing with her and getting her gree bags and her voodoo spells and things like that. So very interesting part. And then we go to Jean Lafitte, one of the most famous pirates of Louisiana and an interesting story about John Lafitte that I didn't really get to in the documentary is they have a place called pirates alley in new Orleans, very extremely haunted, energetic, place you know what is if we can get into what the meaning of haunting really is but the energy there is very noticeable whenever you enter that area when you whenever you enter like a certain part of south louisiana in general the energy shifts for me at least it just feels very dense and dark during uh in some of these areas in the french quarter like pirates alley people have claimed that especially women have claimed that they will be walking down the street and feel the disembodied hands on their bosoms or buttocks and is squeezing them. And this is attributed to the, the, the pirate ghost of Jean Lafitte and his horny crew of pirates. So interesting story there. If you ever go to New Orleans and you want to get groped by a ghost... That's that's the where you go, Pirates Alley. You can get some etheric scurvy while you're at it. Good <laughs> lord. How wild, man. But the Jean Lafitte stuff was fascinating, dude. How he, you know, helped uh, Andrew Jackson um, fight yes. off the British and then how li literally the governor was then forced sort of to pardon him and his men and all these fast it's just such an interesting story, dude. And it's got such a cool blend of history and mysticism and freaky woo woo and all of it. It's just one of the coolest damn things ever. You could have broken it up into so many different things, but I'm glad you put it all together like you did because it's one more mind-blowing thing after another, but you really go through the hemispheres of your brain as well when you go to this because you're looking at historical things that are really interesting and just fucking fun. Then you go to this like dog man and Scott Pace's stuff and you're just like, holy shit, what the fuck? But yeah. it's, it's such a <laughs> ride, dude. I love it. It is, yeah. Directly after you, we visit John Lafitte, we take you to the thrill ride that is Scott Pace's yeah. life. From everything from Bigfoot and Dogmen to little hairy creatures and lights coming out of the sky, aliens, extraterrestrials, it's a thrill ride. And that was that's the, one of the biggest parts that we focused on in the whole film because it was just it was so amazing his story, and we had to cut up uh, his story in the ha uh, in the between. The, the middle and end of his story, we put the, the mounds with Dr. Gregory Little, and that was a, one of my favorite parts as well. I was thrilled that Dr. Dr. Little agreed to come on and talk with us about it and the history and information he banged out about the age of the mounds and some of his theories about what they are and some of the ancient, the super extremely ancient, advanced ancient civilizations that could have built these as precursors to the pyramids that have used them for star alignment ceremonies. And on top of all of that buried in some of these mounds were remains of humanoids from 10 to 15 foot tall. So cool Dude, shit there. It's so interesting. And I loved how he tied it over to Egypt and he talked about that mound builders and yes. pyramid builders, the mound builders came before the pyramid builders. So it's a stair step in evolution, but they're so old here. He said like 913 BC or something like that was one of these data. And, and that's an insane date for Yeah, the oldest at the LSU mounds is like 200,000 years old, man. Insane, dude. It, and it, again, it's just so fascinating and it makes you just wonder like crazy. So let's... um. Let's talk about graveyards in Louisiana, and then I'm going to pop into a couple of the things you talked about here, and let's do some deep dives on it. So uh, graveyards out there, cemeteries, those are fascinating. I mean, of course, they're built and designed the way they are because the city's uh, below sea level, so uh, you, they just float, right, whenever it, it inevitably <laughs> floods out there like three times a year. So the cemeteries themselves are fascinating that the dead are just kind of right there with you, you know, in a lot of cases. So uh, mm -hmm. talk to us about those and then just some maybe some stories or legends that have to do with that. Well, this the, the cemetery, uh, St. Louis Cemetery Number One, is the one of the most famous cemeteries in New Orleans. This huge, massive, 
you could actually get lost in this cemetery. It's like rows and rows and it becomes a maze of graves. It's super creepy. Marie Laveau's grave is at the center of this cemetery and people go and leave her offerings. And it's just like this big shrine. It's very creepy. Uh, people are no longer allowed after a couple of the recent hurricanes because there was a lot of vandalism. I don't know if they reopened those recently. There you go. Yes, this is one of the creepiest cemeteries you will ever see. And on top of what I just said, yes, like you said, these graves are above the ground. They're above ground, yes, because it floods. And uh, if it would get too bad, the water the water would, uh, you know, make the bodies come up above the ground and you'd have some dead bodies floating, which uh. unfortunately during Hurricane Katrina, that happened anyway. It flooded so bad during Katrina the bodies came out of those stone graves that were above ground and were floating amongst the city and amongst the people trying to escape the city. How would you so, like that job? You got to sort the new dead time. guy out from the old dead guy. You know? He, no, no, no. Yeah, he died a long time ago. <laughs> that's crazy. It was a night, dude. Uh, New Orleans in that area was like the the seventh level of hell for a very long time. They had some extremely dark stuff after Katrina, and you just didn't want to go there. You did not want to go anywhere near there. So yeah, that cemetery is is creepy and. The like you said, that's probably the most important thing is those graves are above ground and anywhere you go in in that bowl that is uh, the area of New Orleans, that parish, Jefferson Parish, it's in a bowl. The, it's below sea level. It's pretty crazy how the topography works there. And if it floods everything is going to be flooded you're going to be underground and this is one of the most interesting parts about louisiana in general to me is the hurricanes every year you have so much just incredible destruction from hurricanes that come through and you have these very stubborn families that refuse to ever leave their homes they say i've lived here my whole life i'm not leaving for this one and unfortunately you know what happens some of them die some of them lose their homes and this happens every every year repeatedly because it seems like and it especially in recent years in recent decades louisiana has has been hammered by hurricanes yeah you know we, we all know the theories Houston, about so they that, sort of but... get the same weather yeah 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 so it's it's that's an interesting thing man and that's one of the reasons why i just had to to live somewhere else i had to move somewhere else you're taking a gamble on your home and life every year just by living there yeah pass you know it's worse than an hoa <laughs> It's a G-O-D H-O-A. It's God's yeah. H-O-A. He's like, oh, I don't like that you have trash on your street. Fuck your houses, you know? <laughs> How odd. Uh, I did want to point this out, though, because we're video versioning it here, guys. If you want to check the link in the show description, come check it out. This is an interesting shot. They're pretty proud of this. The cross on top of the uh, uh, grave yeah, here, the and then the chemtrail. <laughs> what a it's wonderful... A I love that. Thanks a lot, guys. We appreciate yeah. that. Um, but fascinating pictures, man. Fa it's just an interesting culture down there. And just like in the movie, uh, you guys are depicting sort of a vibe. I mean, there's just so much history there. I've been to New Orleans once. I learned I, it was not during Mardi Gras, but I was down on Bourbon Street, stayed in the French Quarter. I was helping a friend move back to Houston, so I drove out there to help him move. So we stayed out there for a night, and I learned how to skateboard absolutely shit housed on bourbon street at like two in the morning <laughs> and we had a blast man it was really cool but there is something about the area man it's just like you said heavy or thick so do you yeah. think that's because of all the crazy shit that's happened there or do you think that it's a crazy area that then draws the fact that crazy things mm, happen the there? you know is chicken, and chicken egg or egg thing. yeah i i know that the slave history had to add a level of negativity to everything. I mean, that's that's some darkness that occurred there because of all the even before the, the bloody history from the wars that took place there. There's a hidden history, of course, just when we talked about the mounds, there's apparently a history before even what we understand as Native Americans. Who knows what kind of trauma could have happened to the land, but on top of that, you have your voodoo and other types of black magic practices that 
were being utilized in the early formation of Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase and beyond, that maybe it opened up some kind of portal activity or some kind of uh, negative consciousness that inhabits the area now because of that. But just go ahead and try and camp out in the swamps of just i'll say terrebonne parish because that's where i grew up in the middle of nowhere go and bring yourself a tent and a maybe a little p-rog and go out on the bayou at midnight and see how long you can just sit out there i guarantee it's not going to be long there's not even people who have lived there their whole lives they don't go camping out there there's no people don't go camp you know why because it's scary as shit that's why (laughs) there's some there's some crazy stuff out there that's wild. I didn't even think about that. So there's not really many REIs out there, right? Not a big. There outdoor are, but they're adventure. not in the the. They're not in the the wilderness swamp areas. Okay, they're, not where they're, they're, hanging they're out. right next to where a highway is, so they can you know get easily. in, get the fuck out, yes, go to Florida. Yeah. yeah, go to Florida or somewhere else, right, where you want to go camp. Dude, yeah, that's exactly. wild. I didn't even think about that. That. Areas of camping. Are there a lot of national parks out there, like state there, parks and there, things like that? There's a couple, but they we don't have nature trails. It is insane. It's the weirdest thing that I I didn't even start noticing until I started making this film. I'm like, man, there's no nature trails. There's not much people do out in the wilderness except for hunt and fish. And then the hunters come back with stories like, Man, you better be careful out there. There was this thing that almost ate me, and then this happened, and the world caved in, and it's it's crazy, man. So it's apparently a very dangerous place, and just from the few times I've gone out there as a child, I mean, I used to go out there a lot, but not into some of the most really like abandoned areas that nobody goes to. I lived in a somewhat populated area. Our swamps were kind of um saturated with people fishing and hunting and things like that but there are areas there are areas out there where there's nobody and there's nothing and that's the areas that i dare you to go and chill at for a night damn well it is on my bucket list though that me you jen and mary go on a airboat ride i want to drive one of those fucking things i want to operate one of those deals have you ever driven an airboat no it's on my bucket list yeah. Really? Okay. Well, we'll go rent one for the day and swap off, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the airboat things, man. What I what we did as a kid is we had P-Rogues, which is very massive canoe looking things. And we'd put a little uh, motor on it and we just cruise the bayous, man. Dude, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> but most of it's like water, right? Is that, the, yeah, is that true? Yeah. There's a lot of canals, a lot of waterways. It's wetlands. It's most of it. The south part of Louisiana is swamps and wetlands. And then you have your, uh, you know, neighborhoods and and cities built up in between it. So that's what it is. It's just the water immersion part of it's interesting, too. And you talk about freaky woo woo and stuff like this, because Mike Ricksecker um, talks about that humidity is necessary for ghost manifestations. Like you don't see a bunch of them uh, manifesting in dry, arid or like desert type areas or whatever. You need humidity. And so it's interesting when we talk about water and how much water plays a role in freaky woo-woo, piezoelectricity, all kinds of shit. So to be like, you know, immersed in it, basically all your foundations are sunk into water, you know, everything's just wet out there and it's got to carry a current, you know, of just something fantastic. Plus Mm. you're dumping the Mississippi out. So there's got to be energetic fall from that. And then as well, I mean, everything happening in the Gulf right there. And then that weird pool that's under the Gulf, you know, everything's kind of right there. You've seen that, the guy that died in the helicopter crash just after talking about, he was a submarine captain that went down and bounced off of something. He found more water underwater. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Anyway, uh, that's all right there. So you've got all this water component that then plays into this freaky woo-woo. Do you think that's got maybe anything to do with it? I definitely do, because you think... The humidity in Louisiana, man, uh, growing up, I just remember it, it was miserable. You'd walk outside during the summer and just go to your car and your underwear would be wet. It's oh, yeah. just awful humidity. And that accounts probably for a lot of the dense, heavy feeling that you're feeling, although there's a lot more to it than that. But that would make a lot of sense that it this that water does carry energy with it. I've had plenty of profound spiritual experiences with and in water, so it would make sense that the, if an area is more saturated, that maybe would possibly have more energy. But if you think about it, I've passed through 
Texas many times. I've passed through many states in this beautiful country. And there's area, there's always these areas that I pass through where I get these vibes like, oh, this is a kind of creepy place. I think it's everywhere, man. It's just not in the built up places or uh, cities where a lot of people are, are saturated. It's just the phenomena likes to be elusive. So I think anywhere we go in on this planet, we're going to find places exactly like this. You know, it just depends. I don't know. Maybe it's what's underground. Maybe it's the atmosphere. Maybe it's the ley lines. Who knows? But there are these areas that are extra special, more special than others. That's so interesting. It's fascinating mm -hmm. you say as well that they're not in city centers and stuff like that, because you're right. The city centers are full of human freaky woo woo, like humans losing their fucking mind. <laughs> that's on enough each other. freaky woo woo that that's we enough, do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's why, what's that movie? I forget what the movie was. Anyway, the girl's like, Oh, the crow, when she sleeps in the graveyard, and he's like, you slept oh. in the graveyard, and she's like, yeah, it's the safest place to be. All the people are dead, right? And so, but if you think about it too, then the freaky woo-woo, the phenomena, likes to work on the fringes or the outsides, and it either pushes you towards a civilization because you don't want to deal with it, and it scares you, or it pushes you from civilization like us and out to the areas to go check it out and see what it is. So it either draws or repels. It's an interesting sort of fact that either pushes you into the cities which may then inevitably lead to this transhuman agenda right you can see the scalability of because you're unwilling to deal or to interact with or engage with something that could be a natural phenomena here just occurring and because you can't deal with it you get flooded into these cities and then controlled on a human level so it's like a trade-off you know um it's just fascinating man but we are drawn to the outside yeah, I think it's a totally natural phenomenon. And where I'm sort of at with the whole Bigfoot connection is that these beings have been immersed in nature their entire lives. They've been immersed in the phenomena their entire lives. They communicate with it. They're a part of it. They know how to manipulate it, probably. So that's why they're able to do the freaky deaky things that we see the Bigfoots do because they're not in a technological state. They're not in with us stupid humans and us hairless monkeys in there. You know, they're living the life out in nature, levitating stones and talking with their mind and stuff. So that's, you know, I think that's uh, Bigfoot's like the, uh, the sorcerer of the forest, but he's got a Ooh, lot of hair. I love that. Yeah. Harry, <laughs> Forest Sorcerer. I dig yes. that. That's another great band name. You know, I have a buddy of mine, Asher. You may want to interim for your next uh, interview him for your next film just for this bit alone. You know, I'm going to butcher it, so he'll do way better at it. But he brought up a point one time. He's like a pen pal of mine. He's one of these guys that just wrote in, and we just became buddies. You know what I mean? And so he'll write me in with things. on How I have him saved in my phone is like mind-blown emoji, Asher, mind-blown <laughs> emoji. Every time he writes me, it's always something just fucking amazing. He, had, he just threw in a thought on Bigfoot one day. He just threw me a little quick thing. Hey, what do you think about Bigfoot being a 100% right-brained creature? Exactly to what you're talking about, meaning that he's never had to engage the left hemisphere of his brain, meaning they don't think in terms like we do. So, of course, they vanish in thin air because it's not a thing to them. <laughs> of course, they levitate stones and speak with their mind because, again, they're not limited by needing to incorporate a different – a completely different way of looking at their world. So they're operating 100% in their right hemisphere. I thought it was fascinating. I'd never thought of that before. That's Asher, that, dude. Man, that brings up all kinds of questions for me now. Right? <laughs> like what what could we be doing with our left hemisphere of our brain if we've really focused on some of these other things? Man, we could be super uber human. Yeah, Creature and is this what man. lizard turds are? Are they 100% <laughs> in their left brain, right? And they just can't yeah, yeah, yeah. see like this Babylonian, unempathetic, you know, can slaughter and whatever and just like right. either get joy out of it or whatever, right? The sick things we hear that balance out the energies of all the good things is what we hear. But uh, maybe that in itself is sort of a balancing energy in a, in a way. It's just really interesting, man. It is. Yes, Fuck. dude. Yeah, it's <laughs> mind blowing. I love that. Uh, shout out Asher. Love that guy. Yeah, man. send me his, his information. I I'm going to. to yeah, he's uh, challenging to get a hold of, but yeah. please get a hold of him. I'll make sure to. He's looking out for your for your call here. Now, one of the things I love as well is the Rougarou. I definitely want to talk about this. One of my favorite things. I didn't know that the Rougarou um, had a learning disability. Will you tell us about that, please? Yes, the the Rougarou apparently can't count past 12 and this is part of the uh the local myths and legends it was 
is a very Catholic myth in Louisiana. It, it was very attached to dogma. You can't eat a certain thing on a certain day, some ridiculous thing based on the, the Catholic religion, but specifically this French um, South Louisiana Cajun style of Catholic religion and their culture. So the Rougarou basically is a dog man, is a werewolf, mythical creature, but that lives in the swamps. And we've had all, I've heard all kinds of cautionary tales about the Rougarou and why he comes and how he comes. But basically you do something wrong that goes against God or you, your parents, or you don't brush your teeth at night. He's going to come and he's going to terrorize you basically. Uh, so th what you do to keep him from doing this, there's a few things apparently you can do, but th the easiest thing that most folks will do down there is they take a colander and they put it outside their door. And the colander has many, many holes, many more than 13. And Rougarous are apparently obsessed with counting for some reason, but they can't count past 12. <laughs> I wonder who comes up with these myths. They're so funny. I but love it. <laughs> So, yeah, the Rougarou can't pa count past 12, so he's sitting there all night counting on the calendar until the sun comes up, and he's like, shit, I can't do anything. I, I got to retreat. Off. Yeah. Yeah, you can also do it with 13 pennies and things like that. So Yeah, you put yeah, 13 that's pennies how, on your windowsill so they yes, don't fuck with you. That's how you get rid of the, the Rougarou, in case you ever wanted to know. It's so interesting. So then it makes you want to see if architects have put 13 somethings around a door frame, for instance, you know, and just incorporated it into, into the architecture. And then that would be sort of a. That is very in the interesting. Area. I'd love to go because we've got plenty of amazing old style cathedrals and historical buildings that were, have been around gosh, for ages that I'd love to see if they have any correlations to some of those myths because it is heavily tied with uh, Catholicism. Yeah. God, how interesting. I mean, it's just such an area rich in culture. I mean, we're talking about the same damn area here now. Okay, so let's dive into giants, man, because I'm really curious about what your take is on giants and especially in that area. Are there any legends of giants? I know we find them in mine, mounds, but um, well, any I, legends and all that? There is one that one really kind of terrifying one. And this one, Tony Merkel told me, but it is from Louisiana. It was from one of his friend's sightings that was in an area of the swamp that had just been cleared out and open, just been reopened because a major storm came through and it opened up these new channels and they were exploring these newly opened channels of the swamps. Uh, this one gentleman and his friend in, um, in a little, I think it was a little speedboat or whatever. It's something that they had with a motor and they're cruising along and there's just nothing out there for miles, nothing, nothing. And all of a sudden they, they see up uh, in the distance. I don't know exactly how far away, maybe 50 feet, maybe more, they see a tree like shaking and they look at, and they, they're like, man, something big is in that tree. And all of a sudden, it, no, th this humanoid that was as tall as the tree peeked out behind the tree and looked at him. He said he had this like big beard and bushy hair, and but he was a human. He didn't look like a Bigfoot. He wasn't like completely hairy all over. It looked like he was wearing some kind of stuff on him, like it's kind of weird loincloth material. And he poked his head out behind the tree and looked at it and then hid right back behind the tree. And the dude's like, we got to get out of here. So they just, they took off. So man, maybe, maybe there are still giants, but it, it goes back to all the other stories of giants that like the Kanda, the giant of Kandahar. Yeah. None of these things are verifiable. And it's very strange how time goes on and on. And we still have no definite proof of the paranormal of these giants of these very strange things that aren't a part of our everyday reality. We have individual accounts usually, we have stories that come out on the internet that can't be verified. It's all seems to be some sort of strange mythology that has truth to it in some ways, but that's for us to figure out. I imagine 
Now, with Giants, of course, we have the evidence of Giants throughout history. The Smithsonian supposedly has been covering up Giants ever since they've been digging out the mounds across the the United States. You have the mainstream news articles that even tell you, yeah, we found skeletal remains six to seven foot tall of Giants. And you can go back and look at this yourself, and this is still on the Internet. They haven't scrubbed any of this stuff yet. You can also find this. Look for the individual accounts from newspaper articles from different places. Now, the accounts that I was just telling you is from the government and Smithsonian. They said six, seven foot tall. That was it. But independent articles and newspapers and independent accounts and stories and even books written from that time from people who were digging up the mounds themselves. Not our government, not the Smithsonian, just normal Joe digging up a mound looking for some gold would report 10 to 15 foot tall skeletal remains found. So they were being found. They were also being covered up. The question is, why cover it up? What's the big deal? Why? What's the big deal if we were, had some giant humans? I mean, is there must be something linked to that that they don't want us to know about. There has to be something more to the correlation of giants and giant humans that is dangerous to the status quo, that's dangerous to authority. So that is where we have to start making those connections. Why don't they want us to know about our ancient giants? Does it have free energy implications? Were they not human? Were they a part of some other breakaway civilization? I don't know. So they're very interesting questions to ask around giants. Yeah. And then the six fingers and the second, the double row of teeth, um, (laughs) typically red hair, things like that. So there's some interesting features that also are human, but not human, right? Uh, Six toes, things like that. Well, then you also have different types. It seems like there's many different types of humanoid remains that don't fit what we are as modern homo sapiens sapiens the cone heads the ele- the, the yeah, elongated like, skulls yeah. that were not you know uh, manipulated by certain tribes to make their skulls do that they were seemed to be natural based on the formation of the skulls then you had the little little tiny people on the other side of the scale little hobbit people so i think we had all different sorts a gamut of humanoids but for some reason, they, there's no admittance of it. There's no real – or the evidence is being hidden. And that's like why is the big, huge question. Pun intended, big, huge question, man. Yes. Dude, <laughs> I mean what a wild thing because, yeah, I, I mean you could tell that the implications would be gaslit because then there'd be fear involved, right? People, oh, no, they're going to eat our faces because allegedly they're cannibals, right? There was that story uh, right. uh, among the Paiutes. Right. The book that the lady wrote about um, an actual tribe that said that they found a cave of giants that they would emerge out of the mouth of this cave. So one day the tribe got tired of them setting traps for the indigenous and then they would fall in this thing and die and then they would pick them up and eat them. The giants would. And so they hunkered out in front of this cave and would kill them one by one as they would come out at night to get a drink. It was in the desert. But then, you know, they got tired of this and they said it's not taking long enough. So they piled the whole front of the wood with cave and packed it with wood and then just lit it on fire and killed all the giants that way. And since then, they've gone into that cave and excavated. Of course, yes, Smithsonian has their hand in it, but there has been giant remains found in there. So it's Mm. this very interesting real-life scenario story that's passed down as fact through an indigenous culture that has a physical location, sort of like the Sipapu that the Hopi say they came out of in the Grand Canyon. It's a physical place. They have a satellite photo of it. It's a giant hole, you know, right there on the bank of the Colorado River. So these physical... Locations on Earth, sort of like hierophanies, right? This place where the gods or where these amazing things happen on a physical plane is just interesting to me, man. And I think mounds sort of, lo- you know, uh, mark these sort of locations as well. And especially then to bury the motherfuckers underneath it, you know? It's like that's just the practice. They had to bulldoze. And maybe the giants were the ones that built the mounds, you know what I'm saying? And it wasn't a big deal to them. That's just how they buried their dead. I think that you're onto something there. And I'm going to, while we're on unverifiable things and and giants on top of that, I've got to tell you a very interesting story that I heard from one of my guests. And I'll even say his name because I'm sure he doesn't really give a crap if we talk about this. He's probably still talking about these things. Shane Bales, Shane the Ruiner, Shane the Ruiner Bales. Are you familiar with this gentleman? No, I'm writing it down. (laughs) Okay, Shane the Ruiner Bales is um, a self 
self-proclaimed escapee of the Illuminati. He was supposedly born into an Illuminati bloodline, uh, groomed and bred to be in the Illuminata and uh, rule the world or whatever they do. But he somehow managed to escape and sign all kind of deals, say he wouldn't talk about this. It's okay to talk about that. You do this and this and that. Very interesting. And his stories are very elaborate. And he definitely seems to believe them. So I enjoy having him on. It's entertainment at the least. So and he has very profound stories to tell. Well, he told one story about him. And Shane, please correct me if I'm wrong in any of this. Send me an email and yell at me. But he told a story where he was in an underground chamber with his Illuminati cohorts and his objective was to communicate with a giant in stasis, in a stasis uh, chamber. And he said it was about 15, maybe larger foot tall, and he was psychically communicating. And there would be an age where this giant was released from his stasis and this fascinating, you know, Star Wars type story that uh, I tend to hear from this gentleman. And uh, I just thought I'd bring that up as a very interesting um, giant anecdote and things that we cannot confirm there's so many of these amazing stories from people who are quote unquote whistleblowers who have experienced anything beyond what we can comprehend only from sci-fi movies and they seem to believe their stories very profoundly. And these people fascinate me because it's so beyond anything I can. Look, I've had some incredible psychedelic plant medicine, meditative experiences, and I've come back going, what the hell? Just, you know, totally amazed and mind blown. But some of the stories that <laughs> many of my guests have told, it seems in, so beyond anything that a human can experience, it's hard to comprehend. And this is why I love what we do here, because our comprehension level as humans, I can see it. I can sense it. It is growing. We are being we're, we're coming to accept more and we're, and the more I think we come to accept, the more that we will experience of some of these uh, very high, strange things. And I've. I've experienced in my own life and many other people are observing some of the same, same strange things. It's like there is this not only collective awakening of consciousness, but this major hundredth monkey effect where one person will experience or become aware of something. And all of a sudden the next day, it seems like everybody's like, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I get it. It's very, very cool, man. It's very these, strange. These wild concepts are being dropped in. You're not wrong at all. And it's an interesting, astute observation, man. I'm kind of, you know, coming out of that dark uh, time there and feeling a lot better, honestly. I'm choosing better, which is great. And that's, um, that's, I think, the real key to this thing. Now, something fascinating that you talked about, about the Giants being released at a later time. We, um, I, It just reminds me of the Phil Schneider story about the Battle of Dulce, right? And that there's an underground base there that it ties into that the uh, the underground base at Dulce goes so many lowers uh, under the Archuleta Mesa down there. And there's DNA experiments, chimera experiments, all that stuff taking place with, of course, extraterrestrial races involved or whatever they are. And then also they're making all of these creatures, again, with all of the giants and things that are entombed in different stasises uh, yeah. to then be released at some point as a part of this Project Blue Beam scenario, perhaps. Meaning that, of course, there's freaky shit going on in the sky that's just holograms, maybe. But then yeah. really there's a real giant running after you to kill your dog. So you're not going to know what's a hologram <laughs> and what's not, right? So it's yeah. interesting when you say this stasis to be released later. This yeah. also makes me think of retro causality and quantum physics and how really we're creating our past and present and future at the same time from this present moment. So whenever you plant seeds like that, that there are giants stored in underground facilities that will be released at some time, are we now expecting people to create that with us, right? And so maybe there were no giants ever, but this guy needed to get the seed planted by a secret society organization so that we could retro causality make it happen. Now this plays into the, what do they call that? Predictive programming to yeah. a bigger scale, right? It's not having you predict the future, it's having you predict all of it, retro future and past from your present moment due to these little seeds dropped. 
That would make more sense than anything because <laughs> I don't know if you've heard. If you don't know if you've heard about Phil Schneider's real story, it's it's unfortunate and it's disappointing. Uh, I've heard about this from Darcy Weir. He told me that he saw pictures of Phil Schneider as a kid with the fingers like missing. Aww, so it that was he didn't a get childhood. Blown off in that. No, it was a childhood injury. So that makes. It leads to how much is he is he really elaborating on and lying about, you know, so because if he's going as far as to say a childhood hand injury is an alien ray gun that blew his fingers off, the man is obviously not to be trusted on some levels. So, yeah, it's, it's it all adds to every like, you know. It's all theater in it, it. To what level are the players aware that it's theater? That's where I'm at. Even politicians, world leaders, it's all a play. And most of them, I don't even think they realize that they're a character in this play and they're playing their role so well. They're so into it and they're just marching along and they, the whole time they're being directed by this unseen force. That is the grand director of everything, and they think, you know, this is going to be their plan, but it's really not. It's very interesting. God, I love this. <laughs> okay, uh, you guys, you and I are going to get into this, okay? We're going to do it in the afterthought, so if you guys want to join us for those, please check the link yeah. down in the show description. Uh, come hang out with us as well for the Hangouts. Those are a blast as well. We're doing some live episode recordings and Hangouts and stuff. It's fun, man. You know, we have live artists come in. So uh, all the ways, of course, to find you located down below your previous two episodes, 90 and 209, as well as all of the things Forbidden Knowledge News, your Tubi documentary, which we're so proud of you, dude. Again, I can't like shout this thing from the rooftops enough. Guys, go just check it out. Link it. Uh, it's going to be linked down there so you can share the shit out of it. Um, and just wanted to thank you, dude. Like, bottom of my heart, man. So I'll tell you what, for this part of it, before we get into the afterthought, wrap us up on this free bit and just say, dude... Give us some hope, man. Like, what keeps you moving forward? Because these are crazy times, and this isn't easy, and there's still a 3D element to this that affects us all, whether we'd like for it to or not. What keeps you moving forward, man? All right. What keeps me moving forward is it's honestly because I've seen the future. And I, I, I'll say that in a way that is I haven't – I'm not a psychic. I haven't had any – um, alien visitation where they have taken me, but I immerse myself in very powerful psychedelic situations and I have had some of the most profound experiences of my life through plant medicines and everything I'm doing where I'm at now, because I'm sitting here right now, I owe all of that to my explorations of consciousness and what these beautiful little funguses have shown me and connected me to is a field of information that is me, is my highest me. And this in field of information was always there, just waiting for me to find it, as is everyone's ultimate highest field of information. And that's all it was. These, uh, these mushrooms reconnected the neural pathways for me to reach that highest uh, person that is uh, if you want to call it that this highest intelligence entity and this is a teaser for you guys to stick around for final thoughts i will tell you a story about how i met my future self so stick around